Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Confucius. Hi, this is Tiang Stringer, and thank you for joining me for the very first installment of How By The Way Survived the Year of Impasse, for the record. By The Way Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ Worldwide, Inc. began over 62 years ago during this particular week in the month of September. It was in the heart and the mind of the Apostle Smallwood Williams to start an organization that was based on collective leadership. It would be that model that would challenge the Bible Week Church on July 4th, 1997 in our nation's capital at what we call affectionately the Mother Church, 1100 New Jersey Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C. Cause when I'm resting in my grave nothing else can be said may the work i've done speak for me now may the light i leave we know the significance of july 4th in america but we also know the significance of the number 40 for that would be the 40th year of the Bible Way Church. 40 is the number of complete test. Moses was exiled at 40 from Egypt after killing a young soldier. Moses would take Israel back from the brink of the promised land into the wilderness to wander for 40 years and die off. So the children from infancy to 19 will go into the promise. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. According to Jewish thinking, you're not a man until you're 40 years old. So here we are in the 40th year of the Bible Way Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would Bible Way rise is the question. How would it rise? What was the plan for its rising? The Apostle Williams left us a document that would address certainly this issue. The document is known in Bible Way as the Order of Succession. That document will be made available to you. You will read that document and realize that the plan was simply this, that there were two men who the organization would fall to. And these two men were expected to cooperate with each other. At the end of that cooperation period, we were to choose who would be the leader. That is the successor of the Apostle Smallwood Edmund Williams. In Inman, South Carolina, Apostle Williams, before he would go on to be with the Lord, left us this last message. It would be his final keynote address, and that message was entitled, Two Builders, Two Foundations. Kind of eerie, right? But in the fashion of the progenitors, Apostle Williams was wise enough to know that potential division waited down the road for Bible Way. He preached it. He talked about it in his sermon, and he left a document, hopefully, to avoid it. But it was unavoidable, because these two men would not work out the order of succession. Here's how it would go. Once Apostle Williams would go home to be with the Lord, then the board was instructed to get together and decide among two men. That is, the Apostle Lawrence G. Campbell and the Apostle Huey L. Rogers as to who would initiate this order of succession. Once they came up with that, we would ratify it and we begin the process. It would be a six year process. And simply was this, whoever came out first to be the initial interim, and I want to underscore interim presiding bishop, not the successor, but the interim presiding bishop, that person would serve for three years. The other would serve him as his vice presiding bishop. At the end of the initial three years, then it was to flip. The person that was the presiding bishop now becomes the vice presiding bishop, and the one that's the vice presiding bishop becomes the presiding bishop. That was the order of succession. At the end of those six years of revolving tenureship, we were to vote and decide who then would be the successor. So anyone stating that they succeeded Apostle Williams right after 
he died is not telling the truth. That really is fake news. He was an interim presiding bishop, for we had not solidified who would be the successor. I want to write that first in the record. There was no successor in 1991. There was only interim ship, which eventually led to the successor. And that successor would come out of the 1997 meeting, ironically, the 40th year. Now, you couldn't script this better. Apostle Williams, I assume, did not know he was going to go home with the Lord when he did. I know that he perhaps knew his time was coming, but he had no grasp of the actual time. He certainly did not know that he would time it, or it would be timed, I should say, to arrive at the 40th year. No, this was providence. This was predestination, which is why this move was key, because God was not done with the Bible Way Church. So the bishops emerged from their meeting and they had selected Apostle Lawrence G. Campbell as the interim presiding bishop and Apostle Huey L. Rogers as the interim vice presiding bishop. We ratified that under the precondition that when Apostle Campbell was done with his interim presiding bishopric, that he would then serve under the Apostle Rogers. So for the first three years, we were into the weeds. We were beginning the process to fill these men out. Pastor Campbell presided over the organization in a fine fashion. We did quite well. The organization began to reconstitute its constitution. We began to change it, began to organize it so it would meet our future. So here we are in Indiana prepared now to move into the next three years of the arrangement. That is the order of succession, the one that was left by our honorable apostle Smallwood Williams and ratified and voted on by the boards of bishops and the general assembly. Well, guess what? The apostle Lawrence G. Campbell decided he was not going to honor the last half of the agreement that it was beneath him. That is a demotion for him to serve apostle Huey L. Rogers as his vice presiding bishop. I might add that Apostle Huey L. Rogers served admirably as his vice presiding bishop during the interim period. As a matter of fact, he was a virtual Joshua. You didn't hear much from him. He didn't get in the way. He stayed in his lane and he served, waiting for his chance to be the interim presiding bishop as agreed upon. So that, of course, threw us into a constitutional crisis. There was nothing in our constitution, nor was there in the order of succession that would meet this problem. What ended up happening was that the apostle uh, Huey L. Rogers decided to put two men in office to serve him since Apostle Campbell would not serve in that position. He anointed both the uh, Bishop Andrew C. Jackson of Columbia, South Carolina, and Bishop Joe Nathan Brown of Maryland as his vice presiding bishops. He dignified him with that honor. And we accepted it because we had no choice. No choice because Apostle Campbell refused to honor the agreement ratified again by the bishops and the General Assembly, the collective leadership of Bible Way. And so as we moved into this era of darkness, the era foretold by our leader, two builders, two foundations, as this time would premiere, you begin to see something in Bible way that had not been seen openly. You begin to see a lot of politicizing. You begin to see camps and teams set themselves up. Those of this ilk and those of that ilk. And here I am, somewhat still green, still naive, I would dare say, kind of walking in the spirit of that three-month-old there in 1957, oblivious to the import of this new era dawning. I did not know what would be the import. I was just trying to be a churchman. I was just trying to be a youth president. I was just trying to lead the organization in the area that I was appointed to. And then one day we were having a planning session at 261 Rochester Avenue, a.k.a. the Apostolic Mecca. And the Apostle Rogers, after that session, called me aside and he had in his hand the Constitution that we've been working on for the past three and a half years. And he says to me, District Elder Stringer, I need you to look at this and tell me what you think about the document. So I took it home and began to pull it apart and began to recognize 
many of the inconsistencies and errors in the document. And I pointed those things out to the chief apostle. Little did I know that that was the impetus of me becoming very involved in this ordeal that took place during the year of impasse and beyond. I did not know what was about to go down because again, I was idealistic. I had my eyes wide open and I was just trying to do my job. And so little did I know that my capacity to understand legalese and constitutions would make me an important part of the events that would unfold in the days to come. There are many people aside from myself that were instrumental in affecting this struggle during the year of impasse. And throughout this series, I'm going to name them. The first I'm going to mention at this time is a young lady by the name of Agnes Gale Edwards. Agnes Edwards was a major force. Here's how she was responsible. So after the apostle had asked me to look at the documents and to decipher them and to come up with what I thought, it was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, that Agnes Gill Edwards followed me around seemingly incessantly without stop. And she kept asking me to help. She said, we need you to help us. And I'm like, help you do what? And she would not relent. She was like the widow and the unjust judge. Agnes would not release me. She kept asking me to help, asking me to fight. And I didn't know what was going on. I was clueless, even though... I had deciphered the document. I yet did not understand the veracity of what was happening within the organization, even at that time. So after a while, after about two days of her following behind me, asking me to help, I simply said, okay, I'll help, I'll help. And I said it with that kind of frustration because she was relentless. Well, from that point forward, Agnes Gale Edwards and I became a major team. Without Agnes, I would say it would have been impossible I'll say it again, impossible for us to pursue this case and win it because it was fought on so many fronts. And what Agnes brought to the team was that she kept everything, every record, every note, every filing. And she would refer to me as string in privacy. Of course, the possible in public, but in privacy, she says, string, we got to keep notes. We got to keep a record. She says, string, we got to have a paper trail. That was that chase bank experience that she had coming to bear in this case and i would dare say in her loving memory if agnes had not been on our team we would not have been able to pursue this case because the lawyers depended on our documentation of which agnes had it all she was excellent and, and i and i really miss her because she was very important to this process agnes was also professorial Many don't know this, but Agnes actually dreamt our success. Before she passed on, Agnes said to me, String, I had a dream. I said, what was it, Agnes? She said, I had a dream that we cut their heads off and there was no blood. Now, the interpretation was that we were going to win without blood being shed. And she told me that dream. I never forgot it, even though she was not alive at the ending of the case. We literally won this case without the shedding of blood. I'll explain it to you throughout this process. But to the memory of Agnes Gale Edwards, it was that young lady that came to me and that she kept on badgering me and said, we need your help. It's because of her that I got involved in the impasse of 1997. So here's where it all began for me. Before I had a conversation with the Apostle Rogers, before Agnes would stay on my case like the widow and the unjust judge, I had a dream. And this is the dream. I dreamt that one day we were in the chambers of the mother church. There's a room in the mother church that's behind the offices of Apostle Williams. It's where we would go during convention times when gathered there to change into our garments for ordination or services that required it. And I dreamt that we were in that room. The Apostle Rogers was there, myself, and there was Apostle Williams, and he was sitting in a wheelchair. Now, Apostle Williams appeared to be cold, and Apostle Rogers turned to me and said, he's cold, go find him a jacket. And when I turned to that room, I noticed immediately there was fog, a thick fog. And all I could see were the legs of men. 
And then I turned back to Apostle Rogers with a coat and I handed him the coat. And when he opened the coat to look on the inside, the numbers 18 and a half appeared and the dream ended. Now, I went on to understand at the end of this ordeal that that 18 was significant because everything that happened that was significant generally happened on the 18th of the month. I am not making this up. Even the significant document that caused us to really win this case, it was Exhibit 18 in South Carolina. The very meeting that we had at the Mother Church leading up to the election, where we discussed the election manual, actually happened on January 18. It, it got to the point where whenever the number 18 would come up, they would just look at me because they knew I told them that they being the lawyers and Apostle Rogers and the rest of the group, and they knew that when 18 came up, something was going to happen. Now, Apostle Rogers did tell me that he met with a Jewish rabbi once or he, he had a conversation, I should say, with a Jewish rabbi, and he discovered that the number 18 is lahim, it means life. Now there was one time when the number didn't come out on a significant event and I began to question as to why. And that was on May the 17th, 1997. The Apostle Rogers upon receiving communications from Yvonne's Williams and Pettis, who was the granddaughter and the daughter of Apostle Williams regarding the election process due to take place on the floor in 1997, uh, had asked of the apostle that there would be no elections on the holy grounds of the mother church. Now, you have to appreciate the request. Yvonne Williams was not only the daughter of Apostle Williams, but she was chairman of the board that controlled the property and the assets of the mother church. And if she didn't want an event to take place on the floor of the mother church, guess what? You had to acquiesce because during that time, all of our meetings took place at the mother church. So we were kind of stuck with her wishes. And so chief apostle called the meeting for the purpose to discuss that. It was on the 17th and I wondered why, but as I pulled away from the meeting, I recognized that the 17th was the birthday of Yvonne Pettis. So therefore the significant was that her day preempted the 18th and that from the 17th forward, we would never be the same. I have all the communications. I have all the letters that were sent out from them to the chief. And when you get those letters and read them, it will be clear to you that this was not something that the Apostle Rogers manufactured, but literally they wanted this to happen. So join me tomorrow night at 9 p.m. for the second 18 minutes of how Bibleway survived the year of impasse. This is Pastor Tiala Stringer. Until then. In science, you have what is called a chemical reaction. The parties that make up a chemical reaction are referred to as reagents or reactants.
Usually what's left is different from the reactants or the reagents themselves. This is what happened with the Sabbath proposal that given to us by Yvonne Pettis and Yvonne Williams. They didn't just think up the idea of not having elections on the grounds of the Mother Church. Neither were they prompted by anything Apostle Rogers, who was in charge at the time, might have said to them. What actually caused this chemical reaction was what took place at our workers' meeting in Danville, Virginia. It was on that site where some untoward things took place, many of which I will not repeat, but let's just say they were Trumpian. Campbell wanted to be nominated, and he had the meeting that would call for the nomination process on his site. He had home field advantage, and as a result, he created, let's say, a set of circumstances that were quite embarrassing and troubling to the national body. As a result of his shenanigans, and I say his because I know the man never to allow anything to take place at his ministry that he does not control. In point of fact, he was actually in the room when it went down and he rocked back in his recliner as if it didn't matter to him, kind of nonchalantly. It was that moment that caused the chemical reaction in the spirit of Yvonne Williams who in her letter to us indicated such, that while her and her young son was present in the auditorium, what she witnessed was deja vu. It was troubling to her. It brought her back to a place that she did not desire to be, being there once as a child and again as a wife. And now seeing it in the Bible Ways General Assembly there in Danville. And she said her son said to her, take me away from these evil people. When I give you the document downloads, you'll have a copy of those as well. So that's how we got to the Sabbath proposal. Now let's talk about this. When that event took place there in Danville, ironically so, it happened on Smallwood Williams Day because throughout the week, they were theming the week behind the various founders of the organization. And on that day, I remember distinctly, it was Smallwood Williams Day. What an atrocity. So the Sabbath proposal is not to be confused with the Sabbath resolution. Let's go through the list. So when you start talking about the Sabbath proposal, it was what Yvonne Williams and Yvonne Pettis put together as a uh, suggestion to the presiding bishop, then Apostle Rogers, to not have the elections and in lieu of not having the elections or suspending the elections for that year, they proposed a Sabbath rest. We would cease all activities on the business level and get into the spiritual idea of Bible way, praying and fasting and studying the word of God and teaching based on brotherhood and unity in the spirit. And the brethren on Apostle Campbell's side did not like the idea, but Apostle Rogers heard the complaint. Having been bitten by the ordeal that took place in Danville, his family, church family, and all of those that supported him, and those that were just innocent bystanders were grossly affected by what Apostle Campbell managed there in Danville. And I'll say at this time, allegedly. So it's important for us to recognize that what took place there took place because these two ladies, the granddaughter and the daughter of our founding father, were very concerned that the very first election at the Mother Church would be a problem because of these shenanigans. So that brings us to the reaction that it brought as relate to the organization. So they offered this proposal to Apostle Rogers. Apostle Rogers read it and Apostle Rogers called for an emergency meeting. This was his right under the Constitution to call for an emergency meeting. It's in our articles and bylaws. And according to his interpretation of what was the emergency, he called for the meeting. He duly notified all the officers of which I was one, all of the bishops who were to be in attendance at that meeting. The meeting was scheduled for May the 17th, 1997 in Philadelphia at the Greater Bible Way Temple, pastored by Bishop B.F. Peterson Sr. at the time. And all were asked to be in attendance to discuss this most urgent matter, at minimum to come out with a resolution. 
Well, it is alleged that they were called by those who supported Apostle Campbell and told not to attend. And so needless to say, all of us officers, missionaries, and those elders and pastors that were invited showed up. But the leadership, the ones who pride themselves as the executive board, you know, the highest governing body in the organization, who are supposed to operate in particularly as the executive committee between meetings, failed to show, and in many cases did not even inform the presiding bishop as to why they wouldn't be there. Nonetheless, the meeting went on. And within that meeting, we went from the Sabbath proposal to the Sabbath resolution. The Sabbath resolution that was authored in Philadelphia on May the 17th, 1997, held simply this, that we resolve that we will honor the request of the founding family and that we would suspend elections for one year. There would be no movement business-wise and all the current officers who were in power, many of which were nominated to be elected anyway, would remain in position. And yes, Apostle Rogers, who was not nominated, will remain as presiding bishop with no apparent authority to do anything different until we came to the next year to vote on the nominee, in particular for the presidership, which was Apostle Campbell. So now the proposal of May 17th, 1997, has been voted on for the first time as a resolution. Robert's Rules of Order, of which we are guided by, holds that we have the right to vote on a resolution in a lesser meeting and bring it to a bigger meeting for the final vote by majority and to be ratified. So we took the action of a smaller meeting, according to Robert's Rules of Order, and we would bring it to the 1997 40th Holy Convocation there at the Mother Church, because we were still having the meeting, but elections were not slated at that time. So you have to appreciate the atmosphere that awaited us there in Washington, D.C. during the week that would lead up to the 4th of July, the time of independence celebrated in America. The most important and significant holiday of America was also now the most important time in transition for the Bible Way Church in its 40th year. The stage was set and there were many meetings I can recall Apostle Rogers emerging seemingly weighted down by the detail. They were offering him various titles and positions seemingly to sway what had taken place at the assembly that was called in May. But Apostle Rogers would not relent. He was determined to present this before the General Assembly for final resolution, a vote up or down. It didn't matter to him. We had begun a course and he was determined to finish that course. At that time at the Mother Church, we were meeting, meetings all the time. And we had staked out a place we called the War Room. Now, the War Room was literally the office of Apostle Williams. And we would gather in that room. It was Apostle Rogers, Apostle Michael Rogers, myself, Apostle Parrott. Uh, it was uh, Elder Jackson, Daryl Jackson of Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, it was Bishop Courtney Henry. It was uh, Sister Agnes Edwards. I remember those individually. Uh, there may have been others, but that's why I remember. And we were in the war room. That is the office of Apostle Smallwood Williams discussing what to do as the assembly was approaching. It was on the 3rd of July and the 4th of July that we met and we talked about many things. And Apostle Rogers at that time still wasn't sure what he was going to do. And frankly speaking, we all had our say. He asked us what we thought and we shared our thoughts about how to proceed going forward. And he took it into advisement, never really kind of acknowledging what was going to be the course of action, but just simply hearing us out and understanding the positions and assimilating in his mind what would be the appropriate thing to do as to not to create any angst there at the mother church. Because Yvonne uh, Williams did not want that, and I'm sure he was cautious as to not to bring that. And so what happened next was the 4th of July assembly was nearing. We was upstairs in the war room and we were going downstairs for that fateful meeting. Now, it's interesting because during that particular day, there were two rams. I call them caught in the bush. Two individuals that were not in the war room, who were not in the throes of what was going on, sort of like what I was, ignorant and oblivious to what was happening above our heads. And they were Bishop Brian Collins and Elder David Lowry. 
both these young men had not participated. We had not communicated to them what we were thinking, what was going to go on. Here's what happens. So we come downstairs to the General Assembly. And as we're entering the General Assembly, Bishop Collins is asked by George Plight, should I record this meeting? Collins says, yes, record everything. He turns the camera on. So that gave us the record we would need for later on in the court case. We'll talk about that in another tape. But that record was invaluable with transcript that we took to Columbia, South Carolina before the Masters in Equity, who, when he watched that video, stood up from his chair. He went around to the back of his chair, leaned on the top of his chair with transcript in hand and was watching the video. And he said, this is interesting. This is a judge. I was blown away, but we knew we had him from go when he started watching the video. The second ram caught in the thicket is the elder David Larley. Now, when you watch the videotape, you'll see that I come to the floor first and I initiate contact because what had happened simultaneous with the Sabbath resolution was that the bishops came up with what they call a position statement. That's the third document. So you have the Sabbath proposal. You have the Sabbath resolution. You have the position statement. The position statement was literally that the position of the bishops. And after Bishop Fred Grant read it, I took to the floor to ask questions about it. And Apostle Cornelius Showell, when I asked him what it was about, he says, it's our position. So he never really presented it to the floor. And that was an error, parliamentarily speaking. He should have presented it, but I kind of think they knew they didn't have the vote. So they were trying to bully their way, I guess, into making this be the replacement of the Sabbath resolution. Now, the difference between the Sabbath resolution and the position statement was simply this. The Sabbath resolution held that we would suspend elections. We all remain in office, including Apostle Rogers. And next year, the vote would pick up at our next venue. The position statement held that we would suspend all elections until next year and that all offices would be vacated and Apostle Campbell would sit at the interimship of that Sabbath year and appoint who he wanted in the interim year. Now, how much sense did that make? Why would you take out the people who've been in office for three and a half years now who are running a program and bring in potentially people who have not run the national for an interim year? And why would you want to sit in office getting ready to be voted on in the next year? Nothing was going to happen. According to the Sabbath resolution, we were not going to do business. It was just going to be basic church. As a matter of fact, Pastor Rogers had assumed the title servant leader. He had dumbed down his title for that year. He was not the presiding bishop. And we were already in office. So that was the difference. It didn't make sense to us on the floor. As you listen to this again, does it make sense to you that the Sabbath resolution said no elections? People stay that are in office. We vote next year. Position statement says no elections. Everybody get out of office. Campbell comes in and he puts people in office for just a year. Makes no sense. It was a power play, but it didn't go over quite well. Because as Apostle Showa failed to put the document on the floor, we forced it to the floor for a vote. They didn't expect this. And so we kind of started, you know, limping our way through because our strategy wasn't well defined, but we knew we had to get the document before the people. There were at least 2,500 people in assembly on the floor of the mother church. And we were going back and forth for about an hour, I guess. Women were coming up and speaking. Uh, and many were speaking spiritual things. Mother uh, Peterson was speaking in tongues and the judge kind of liked that too. And it was an interesting exchange and it was civil. It got a little heavy at time, but it was civil. And near the the end of the exchange, Elder David Larley, who was not a part of the program, stands up, takes to the mic, and he has in his hand the Sabbath resolution. And he's trying to figure out how to put this thing for a vote. We should just vote on this. And he was trying to, you know, put it into the proper phraseologies. And and, and beside him uh, appears Elder Daryl Jackson, who, of course, uh, is a former lieutenant governor. So he knows parliamentary procedure. And Daryl assists him in framing the words he needs to put it forth. And when he when he when he says, I make a motion, we accept this. Uh, everybody knows Lawrence Thomas 
He was there. District of Lawrence Thomas was there. And when he said, I, I offer a motion that this be accepted, Lawrence Thomas said, I second that motion. Then he walked away and said, I third it. And everybody kind of laughed kind of lightly. And we voted. And we voted to accept the Sabbath resolution, which held elections suspended for one year, pick up in 1998. And when we voted, there was a vote that was an I vote. Then Bishop A.C. Jackson, the father of Elder Daryl Jackson, God bless his memory, says, I think this is too important of a matter that we have a voice vote. It should be a standing vote. Now, if you pay attention to the video, look closely to the left side of Apostle Rogers and you can see the hand of Apostle Lawrence Campbell. And when uh, Bishop A.C. Jackson stands to get the attention of Apostle Rogers, Apostle Campbell holds his finger out sort of to suggest and gesture to A.C. that he should come and make his, his statement known. I think Campbell thought Jackson was going to do something pro him. And that was kind of funny. So when you see the video, watch that. And when Jackson says a standing vote, Apostle Rogers acquiesced as of the chair. And he says, fine, let's do a standing vote. And when there was a standing vote, uh, George Plight was on the right of Apostle Rogers in the corner by the exit with the camera. And he took the camera and panned it. And when he panned the camera, you see this great sea of delegates standing, voting in the affirmative that the Sabbath resolution, which was pioneered from the Sabbath proposal, which was a suggestion of the daughter and granddaughter of Apostle Williams be embraced for this one year period, that it be embraced and it was yayed and it was accepted. And then he called for the nay vote and maybe 30 or 40 people stood up. And of course it's so carried. That wasn't the end of the ordeal. Now we get into the weeds. Join me on the next 18 minutes of how by the way survived the year of impasse. When he panned the camera, you see this great sea of delegates standing, voting in the affirmative that the Sabbath resolution, which was pioneered from the Sabbath proposal, which was a suggestion of the daughter and granddaughter of Apostle Williams be embraced for this one year period, that it be embraced and it was yayed and it was accepted. And then he called for the nay vote and maybe 30 or 40 people stood up. And of course, it's so carried. Aftermath, the consequences 
or after effects of an unpleasant event. That's what we had experienced and that's what we were going to experience. Little to my knowledge, the fight had just begun. As we closed that assembly, one of the bishop's sons made his way over to where I was standing. He looked me in the eyes and said, you made a big mistake, a big mistake. The next day would be Saturday and I remember sleeping hard that night due to the stress of that assembly in the week leading up to that day. And I remember getting ready to come to the service that evening as I was coming up the hill from the Hyatt Regency Hotel, which we stayed down the street from the Mother Church. I was met by then Bishop S. David Neal. And Bishop Neal said to me, District Elder Stringer, did you hear what they're getting ready to do? They're going to take over the service tonight. I said, does Apostle Rogers know? He said, yes, he knows. As I made my way into a packed auditorium on the lower floor, I looked to the pulpit area and I noticed that all of the bishops were present. And that was odd because generally speaking, during the National Convention after Friday, they pretty much leave town to go back home. I mean, even Bishop White from London, England was still here. So I knew what I had been told by Bishop S. David Neal was true. They were going to take over the service. In my mind, what to do, what to do. As I was going through the service and as worship service pursued, I called one of my VPs over to me and I said, I need you to take over the service and conduct it till I get back. Because in my mind, I had to get to a phone and call Apostle Rogers to find out what I should do. So I moved through the auditorium and I came to the back hallway, which leads to the chapel area. And I went down that stairwell and came up to the back area leading to the war room, that is, the offices of Apostle Williams. And as I was nearing the door, the door swung open, and the deacon met me and said, District Elder Stringer, Apostle Rogers is on the phone, and he wants to speak to you. And I'm thinking timing was excellent. As I went into Apostle Williams' office, I picked up the phone and I said hello, and I can hear Apostle Rogers responding in a heavy voice. I can tell the burden of the week had surmounted him and I knew that he was heavy with contemplation as what to do and he said to me did you hear what they're going to do tonight I said yes sir I hear they're planning on taking over the service I said what do you want me to do he paused and he breathed a little heavy and then he paused then he said to me what do you think we should do I said I think we should close down the service he responded close down the service I said yes shut down the service he paused again he says and who's going to do that I said I'll do it you tell me to close down the service I'll close down the service and he said you'll do it I said yes and he paused he said go ahead after which I hung the phone up and I took the elevator down to the front foyer of the mother church and I passed by the youth table and grabbed a handful of cassettes as if to say I was out there in the lobby. And I stopped in the rear of the sanctuary where the sound man was. And standing there was Bishop Courtney Henry, then just Elder Courtney Henry. And I said to Courtney Henry, I said, Elder, I said, I want you to stand right here by the sound man. And when I give the benediction, he's to shut the system down and turn it on for no one. So I knew that once I closed the service, they were going to try to take the mic and control the service. So I positioned Courtney there and he waited my cue. I made my way down the side aisle and the service was wrapping up to be turned into my hands. So I walked up to the microphone. It was a handheld cordless microphone then. And I released it from its holder and I walked down the stairs to where the communion setting is. If you know the mother church, how it's laid out. There's an upstairs and a downstairs portion. So I walked down those stairs and I stood just by the railing and I began to talk to the congregation. And then as I was speaking to the congregation, I began to segue into the discussion that Apostle Rogers would not be making it out tonight and that there are some concerns he has and he's asked me, to end the service early and I had the people stand I offered prayer and I gave the benediction and as I walked back up to the stairs and I put the mic in the holder Apostle Showell said to me District Elder Stringer, District Elder Stringer what's going on? 
I said, Apostle Show, I don't know what's going on, but talk to Apostle Rogers. He could fill you in. And I turned and walked away. He went over to the podium. He grabbed the microphone and began to bang on it and tried to get it to come on. And he's calling to the people who are moving out by a massive throng. They're they're exiting the sanctuary. It appeared to be at least 1,500 or so. We're exiting out of that youth service, heading out. They had come to hear Sean Tyson from Indiana, but I had just given the benediction. The bishops and the pastors in the podium looked dazed and confused as to what was going on. Pastor Shorewell was saying, wait, come back, wait, come back. But the people couldn't hear him because the mic wasn't on. And he was holding the mic up to be turned on, but it wouldn't come on because I told Elder Henry, under no circumstances are these mics to be turned on. And he realized he would not prevail. He put the mic down and went down to the front and knelt and started praying. And as he prayed, someone turned on the house system of the mother church, was, which was insufficient. Then Apostle Silver said, you got five minutes to pray, then you got to get out of here. And the people were leaving. And I'm told that as the people were leaving, sitting out in the park a lot in a white Mercedes Benz was Apostle Lawrence G. Campbell. The rumor has it that he was waiting to be ushered in to take over the service and to enforce the position statement of him taking over the organization for that interim year. But it didn't happen because the service was ended. The audience was released. Our youth service was cut short, but the organization was spared what might have been a major fight on the floor in the mother church. Due to the wisdom of Apostle Rogers to shut the service down, it has never been done before or ever since, but it was important to be done then. Due to that wisdom, we saved who knows what would have happened there at the mother church. And sources tell me that Apostle Campbell sitting in his car looked dazed and wondered where the people were going. They were going home, sir. At that time, I was trying to locate Apostle Rogers, and I found out that he was staying at the famous Mayflower Hotel in Washington. So I got in my car, put on my navigation, and found the hotel. He was staying in the presidential suite, and as I'd entered the suite in the foyer beneath the floor, there was a seal of the President of the United States, and there was this long hallway. And as I walked that long hallway, I came into an open living room, and there was sitting Apostle and Mother Rogers and the entire Rogers family, along with Apostle Odell Lawley and Apostle Curtis Brown, waiting to hear my report. So I make my way and I sit down and I begin to fill them in on what just took place. And while we're talking, many things were being said. Many questions were being asked. But one of the most important questions that was asked was asked by our Supreme Queen Mother, Mother Doris Rogers. She stopped us in mid-conversation and said, I just want to know, where is the money? And the room grew quiet. She was referring to the $100,000 CD that had been secured by Apostle Rogers, who had saved that money up, who had deferred his keynote addresses, who had done the I Love Bible Way rallies to save the international property, and had amassed a $100,000 CD on the behalf of the organization and no one had an answer. The treasurer was there, who also was a co-signer on the CD deposit. The Apostle Curtis Brown, he didn't know. The General Secretary was there. Apostle Odo Lali, he didn't know. The presiding bishop was there and he didn't know. And in the spirit of David, I opened my big mouth and I said, give me six days and I'll find it. Now again, I was being naive, but I felt the unction to say that. And so I began the process of looking for a virtual needle in the haystack. Where was I going to find that CD? How would I find it? I had no idea, but I opened my mouth and I couldn't go back. We ended the meeting 
And I began the process of trying to locate that $100,000 CD for the organization. It was like looking for a needle in the haystack. I had the choice of 50 states to look. I had no clue. But I narrowed it down to Virginia, South Carolina, and Maryland. I would actually call banks on the telephone. And I would speak to bank managers. And I would tell them who I was. And they would give me information over the phone. They would give me names. And they would give me account numbers. Can you believe this? I can remember calling Virginia to a particular bank. And I said, I believe that our money is in your bank. And I introduced myself and told them our story. And the lady was giving me a bank account number. I have it written down to this day. And while she was giving me the bank account number, she was saying I could be fired for this. But nonetheless, she gave me the numbers. I finally called the bank in South Carolina. It was then the Wachovia Bank because Wachovia had just come into existence. And I spoke with a young lady and I told her the same story. And I said, I believe our money is in your bank. And I said, I believe these are the persons who would have opened up the account. She confirmed that. And I hung up the phone. I called Apostle Rogers. I said, sir, I think I found the bank. I found the account. He said, what are you going to do? I said, well, they're in South Carolina for their convention because now they were meeting on their own. And I said, if you fly me in on keynote day, I can go to the bank and investigate. I said, they'll be too busy to know I'm in town. He obliged. I bought a round trip ticket to go down to South Carolina and come immediately back. It was like an 11 o'clock flight returning at two. I arrived at the airport. A cab met me. It was a black gentleman. And I said, I need you to take me to this address. He took me to the bank. I said, can you wait for me? I'm coming out. He said, yes, I will. So he sat there with the car running and the meter running. And as I entered into the bank, I made myself known to the manager. Upon which she said this to me. She said, I'm going to put you in my office. You can use my desk. Do you want anything to eat? I said, no, I'm not hungry. She said, I'm going to call the locksmith and have him drill open the safe deposit box and you can look. And I waited. The locksmith came in. He drilled open the safe deposit box. She said, you can go and look. I went in the box. I looked and I saw a receipt of the $100,000 CD that was now in the nation's bank in South Carolina. So I had a paper trail. And so I came out of the vault and the lady said to me, well, do you want to open another account? I said, yes, let's open another safe deposit account. And we opened it up. I put my name on it. And as I was leaving out of the bank, she said to me this, and I'm not making this up. She says, let me see your ID. And I whipped out my license and I showed her my ID. She said, okay. And I got in the cab and I flew back home. Now I knew where the money was. Agnes Gill Edwards and I got on the phone and began to speak to a Miss Diane Baines. I remember that name. And I called her up and I told her the same story. I said, I believe our account is in your bank. She said, well, who would be the signers on the account? And I told her who the signers would be. She said, yes, you're right. She went away and came back. She said, okay, I'm drawing the money down into a separate account and I'm going to freeze it until we decide what to do with this. It was this kind of activity that led me to believe that God was on our side. For in six days, I found the money. In six days, I froze the money. And now the battle lines would be drawn as to the legal fight for the life and the soul of the Bible Way Church of our Lord Jesus Christ, Worldwide Inc., in the year of impasse.
So once we discovered the money, we had it frozen at the nation's bank in South Carolina. The bank then filed with the court there in South Carolina for an interpleader. Now, interpleader means they need the court to come in and decide the issue for them because there were two sides claiming to be Bible way and claiming to own the money. And the reason I was able to get it frozen is because I raised that question with the bank and I said to them that that's our money. And if anything happens to it, you are liable to us. So in order to protect themselves, they involved the court and the court would decide it. Obviously, the process that we underwent, eventually it came out. Now, let's go back to Washington, D.C., because that's the initial battleground. So now once we left the General Assembly uh, in the, on the 4th of July uh, in Washington and after that fateful night when I shut down the service, our camps were divided. Uh, Campbell was sending out letters uh, calling for meetings and calling for calm. And then, of course, Pastor Roger was sending out letters regarding his position. They had a meeting. I think it was August the 5th, 97 at the Gospel Ark. And it was a solidarity meeting. And I asked Apostle Rogers, could I go? He gave me permission. And I went to the meeting. And in that meeting, they were discussing, you know, the various aspects of what had just taken place. It was like a rally. I remember that Bishop Crystal Harrison out of Virginia was at the mic when I came into Gospel Ark. And he was saying things like, why doth the heathen rage? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? And they were going up as they would. And then he also said that we cannot allow the tail to wag the dog. And of course, that was met with a lot of hallelujahs, amens and thank you, Jesus. And I'm there and, and I actually stood up to give remarks and I actually addressed the assembly. And I actually said certain things to them regarding the process and what was right and what was wrong. Of course, it fell on deaf ears. I'm surprised they didn't lynch me. I left there with my life in hand. And I went back to the mother church where awaiting me was Apostle Rogers Silver and the rest for a report. We had a dinner and we talked about it. And so we were decisively divided and the Bible Way Church now had two identities. People were confused. Uh, Campbell put out a letter entitled The Apostles Epistle. Some of you may still have that. And in that particular circular, he was declaring that whoever has the name, the logo and the registration at the DCRA, they are indeed the rightful Bible way. Now, what we didn't know at the time that he was channeling the fact that they had done some things uh, in those agencies that we weren't aware of. For instance, the PTO, the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, controls the trademark and the logo. So Agnes, Agnes and I decided, well, we better, you know, we better secure the trademarks. And so we set the application up and we filed the application down at the PTO to discover that Apostle Campbell and Showell had already filed for the logo and trademark. And so that meant a lot to us because whoever puts in first has the time stamp and they are legally the persons who make initial claims. But what happened with their application was interesting. They filed the application, but they put wrong information on it, causing the PTO to kick it out and send it back. What that meant was they lost their seniority. They lost the rights to first claim. And so ours went in right after theirs. We obtained the first claim. And I believe that they stopped prosecuting their application once they discovered that. Even though Campbell filed some documents claiming to have it, he didn't actually have it. And so we hired an attorney from Long Island named uh, Attorney Joseph J. Orlando. And Attorney Orlando uh, told me that we, we beat them out and their file is laying dormant. And in PTO language, it's been abandoned and that we could actually take it over. And so we filed strategically to take it over. We were granted control of their file so they couldn't come back and revive it to compete with us ever again. Upon Campbell finding out, he filed an appeal to Mr. Hampton at the PTO and he was denied. I have that letter and we retained control over that as well. So eventually we did gain the actual control of the logo and trademark all the time we were in pursuit of it. They had lost their first place. Never were they in pursuit of it any longer. And they've kind of told their people they were, but they really weren't. Now, the other thing that he mentioned in his apostles epistle was the DCRA. That's an acronym for the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. 
Now, in my state, that's referred to as the attorney general's office where we file our corporate filing. Well, that's the equivalent in D.C., the DCRA. Now, we didn't know what that was about. But what had happened was they had handed out information uh, to bolster their claims that no matter what was done on the 4th of July, that we invoke the position statement by going to these agencies and we now are rightful heirs and have control of the organization. Now, pay attention to this. They had those documents. We didn't know what that meant at the time. Apostles B.F. Peterson Sr. and Jr. went to their meeting. When they came to our meeting, which followed after their meeting, they brought documents from that meeting. And when they brought those documents from that meeting, myself and Bishop Collins began to pour over those documents. And we saw for the first time the DCRA. And we had no clue what that was. And so we began to research. And in our research, we discovered that that was the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. And we recognize that that's where corporations and churches do file with the state, in this case, the District of Columbia. And so as we investigated, we found out that what they did was they actually went down to that agency after our meeting. And here's what they did. They changed the designation of the organization. The Apostle Williams filed it at the DCRA under what is known as a religious society. That was our designation. A religious society is just a group of people who have gathered for praise and worship and religious activities who have no restrictions placed on them by the District of Columbia. They're not required to do any filing. They're not required to report. And pretty much they wear the general statutes of the district like a loose garment. But what they did was they changed the designation from what Apostle Williams had initiated and they changed it to a nonprofit organization. The difference there is that a nonprofit organization has to report to the district. And when we saw that filing, we knew something was wrong. Not only did they file and change our designation, but they also took Apostle Rogers, who was the presiding bishop at the time, because we're still in interim year. And they took Jonathan Brown and uh, A.C. Jackson, who were VPs as well. They took Apostle Lolly, who was the general secretary. And they took Apostle Brown, who was the treasurer. And they moved them from their designated positions as corporate officers and just put them as a part of the board. They, they put Campbell and the others that they had selected in their group to become the presiding bishop, vice presiding bishop, general secretary, etc. So they changed the corporate filing. Pay attention from a religious society to a nonprofit. And they took Apostle Rogers, Lolly Brown, Brown, Jackson, and they moved them to the rear of their filing and said that they were just basic corporate members. Now, the reason that's important is because they were still maintaining that Rogers, Lolly and Brown were still a part of their group. The filing holds that if you search the records at DCRA, you can verify what I'm telling you. It's there. It's a matter of public record. And so when I saw that filing, I knew that they had done these things wrong, but I couldn't figure out how to challenge. So I began to read the general statutes of the DCRA. And what I found out was they filed the document without the seal of the organization. They couldn't file with the seal because we had control of the seal. And according to the general statutes of DC, that filing could not be received without a seal. So I lodged my complaint and I said to them when I called down, I said, you received this filing. I said it was not legitimately done. And I know that because the seal isn't on there. So on count one, you can't receive this filing without the seal. But the thing that really set it off was when I read further and I found out that if they were going to change the designation of a religious group from a religious society to a nonprofit, they had to send out a notice to the body that votes. That is from the bishops to the delegates of the General Assembly and everything in between 30 days in advance. And I said to Theodore Jenkins, who was the investigator there, I said, they've done none of this. I've received no notice. 
Agnes received no notice and we began to go down the list. And so what we did was we gathered petitions from at least a couple of hundred of the members of Bible we worldwide. And we sent a thick filing with all of the petitions on it to the DCRA, proving that no such vote took place. We did not authorize the designated change of our organization. And this is illegal. The DCRA said to me, well, in all our years as a movement, we never revoked a filing. And I said to them, yeah, if I was the Catholic Church, you would do that. But since we're not, you're not going to do that, right? I said, but you're going to change this. And we fought that for a couple of months to a year and we prevailed. Now, the prevailing is coincidental because all that time while we were fighting technically, even though it was done fraudulently, Apostle Rogers, Apostle Brown, Apostle Lolly and all of us were not Bible way by the virtue of a document that was held down in the DCRA. So on a technicality that was fraudulent, they had us. They had us with our hands in the air because we had to prove our case. So I pressed them. We hired attorney uh, Kenneth Slaughter from Venable there in Washington, D.C. Ken Slaughter said, I'm going to scorch the earth and Ken Slaughter scorched the earth. And so we began to pursue this process. Now, hold on to that because that's important. The timing of how we overturned that is key. And so the very first filing of a lawsuit actually took place by us. That goes back now to the money. In order to free the money up, we had to file a lawsuit against Bishop A.C. Jackson, who was the financial secretary and the countersigner on the CD. He was the one that had the power to take it down to South Carolina and put it in Nation's Bank because he was a signer. When I called the bank and asked them about this, how, how it was that uh, Bishop Jackson had the power to uh, deposit that CD and to cash it rather and to deposit that CD. And there were two signers. The bank said to me, well, that may be true, but we don't follow that policy. Any one of them be it Apostle Brown or Bishop Jackson had the power to cash that CD. So I found out then that that two signature policy, the bank really does not honor, but it was too late, but we had frozen the money. Now they had taken some of the money out to do work on the property. And there was about $1,100 I found in a, uh, an account in Baltimore, which I didn't freeze. We looked at it. I could have frozen it, but uh, Apostle Roger said, well, don't bother with it. But we assumed it was part of that money because it had our 10 number. And the reason we were able to find these accounts is because they used the Bibleways tax identification number. We having that number, when they told the bank what the number was, we had some legitimacy knowing the number. And so we did sue uh, Bishop Jackson. That's why he got sued. There was nothing personal. We were trying to get control of the money. As a matter of fact, Jackson kind of said to Apostle Rogers in a letter, sue me. And of course he was obliged. Now the attorneys went overboard in this suit process, we had an attorney, uh, Craig Kelly, out of South Carolina. We hired him and he was a nice country man. And, um, you know, he was representing us and he went and, and he went and served a, a Bishop Jackson at his church. That was not supposed to happen. No one authorized that. We don't play it like that, but it happened nonetheless. I think it was even on Father's Day, which was a double atrocity. Of course, there was a holy screen as if we'd done it on purpose, but it was not done with our knowledge. Yes, he was supposed to serve him, but no, he don't serve the man at his church on Father's Day. So to the credit of Craig Kelly on his way out, after I had told him we we're going to let him go, he said to me, Bishop Stringer, he said, if you really want to fight, I got just a person for you. Her name is attorney Brenda Reddick Small. He said, she is a fighter. I'll give you her number and you call her and see if she'll take the case. I took the number. I called attorney Smalls and she answered the phone. I said, attorney Smalls, I said, my name is Bishop Terry Stringer. We have a case in South Carolina. We need some help. We're looking for a lawyer. Attorney Craig Kelly has recommended you. I want to know, will you represent us? And then she said to me, well, Bishop Stringer, it depends. She said, if you're going to involve me, I'm in it for the fight. If you're not going to fight, then don't waste my time. Needless to say, she was talking my kind of talk because I was ready to fight because I believed in the formidable warfare of legal battle. 
Even though it was brother against brother, we had no choice. Our backs were against the wall. In Washington, we were no longer by the way. In South Carolina, our money was frozen. We were left with no choice. So with that, Apostle Rogers agreed to secure Attorney Smalls. Then the docket was set. And a week off from our court date, Attorney Smalls contacted us and desired to meet with us in an area hotel that we might discuss the strategies and the plans for the case. So we chose the JFK airport. She flew in and we met in a rented hotel space. And as we were discussing the strategies for the case to happen next week, I asked her this question. I said, Attorney Smalls, what would happen if I.S. Levy Johnson called the Pastor Rogers early in the case? And she gave me this puzzled look and said, well, that's probably not going to happen. And I said, why is that? She said, because Apostle Rogers is the defendant and by the way is the plaintiff. And usually the plaintiff puts their case on first and then they call you. I said, but what would happen if they called him out of turn? She said, well, if they call him out of turn, then that gives us much more latitude to present our case. In point of fact, she said, we can then present our case through him before they have a chance to present the rest of their case. And she wondered why I thought that. I said, well, I want you to keep that in mind because I have this feeling they're going to call him out of sequence. Now, little did she know that I'd heard the Lord tell me that and to prepare our case because they were going to call him out of sequence. And she concluded by saying, but that's probably less likely to happen. I said, well, just humor me and let's prepare for that eventuality. And so we had the transcript from the 4th of July assembly. We also had the videotape from that 4th of July assembly and we made that ready. If they did, as the Lord was telling me, we could then jump right into the meat of the case and present our case. We also had to get an expert parliamentary procedure witness because the case hinged on the 4th of July assembly. So I instructed my secretary to find me a parliamentarian. She sent me three names and I noticed a Joyce C. Parks. So I took that name. Now, when we showed up in South Carolina, Joyce C. Parks is a Caucasian woman. So she sits in the back of the court and then when their parliamentary procedure witness came in, who was an attorney from South Carolina, a black woman, she looked back there and she saw Joyce C. Parks and she immediately responded to I.S. Levy Johnson. What is she doing here? She's my teacher. If she says it's right, then it's right. Now, see, Joyce C. Parks is not just your ordinary professional parliamentarian. She was at the time the master parliamentarian for the country. She was the real deal. So we didn't know it, but unwittingly we hired the best of the best. It gets more interesting than that. In my next video, I'm going to talk about the cases on all fronts and show you the ebb and flow of how God brought this thing full circle and the identity of the real Bible way would emerge and we would be victorious. Join me in the next edition of How Bible Way Survived the Year of Impasse.
Once it was discovered that the Brethren had changed the organization's designation from a religious society to a non-profit organization, they were called up on charges. The Apostle Rogers set a judicial hearing scheduled for November the 20th, 1997 at 9 a.m. at the Radisson Grand Resort in Fort Mill, South Carolina. According to the Constitution, they were sent registered letters informing them 30 days in advance they were to appear to answer the charges of sedition and insubordination. There were four such counts. One, for those that initiated or hosted any actions. Two, for those that assisted in such actions. Three, for anyone who participated after being warned. Four, for those who participated knowing the will of the General Assembly. 28 bishops were called in for charges. Not one responded, but in accordance to the will of the Assembly, they were tried in absentia and they were found guilty. And in accordance to the finding, they were all expelled. That year, on the 20th of November, 28 bishops were expelled from Bible Way. So Bible Way did not split. These men were removed. Nonetheless, they carried themselves on as being Bible Way, continuing to gather in the name of the organization from which they were expelled. After that, we turned our attention to the trademark and logo. We discovered that they had a website using our logo and trademark. So we called in to question all of the activities. We filed a complaint against the administrator, Lyle Dukes, and against Campbell, against both Showells. The judge held that Lyle Dukes could not be held liable because he was just an administrator, but he refused to dismiss the case against Campbell, Showell, and Showell. I'll explain to you later on how that case was disposed of. Now let's turn our attention back to South Carolina. As we headed into South Carolina for the court case and the suit they were bringing against Apostle Rogers, it did appear that they were the Bible way. They had the filing, they had the documentation, and all they had to do was lay that down on the judge's desk to prove who they were. It didn't matter that we had not had a vote. It didn't matter that the assembly wasn't notified. It didn't matter that there were no seals on the documents. All the judge in South Carolina would have known was that these men have come into my court claiming to be Bible way, having documents saying the same. Conversely, this gentleman called Huey L. Rogers has no documents to prove that. So as you can see, we were in a very, very tight place going into South Carolina. But the Lord would intervene. As Ken Slaughter kept pressing in on the DCRA and I kept calling them and badgering them, hard work paid off. That is the DCRA in Washington had sent a letter to Marcel Showell informing them that they were going to revoke their filing. That's right. At 11.59.59, as we were going into South Carolina to hear the case that was against Apostle Rogers, the District of Columbia's office, the DCRA, had ruled that the filing was false and they were going to revoke it. Can you imagine that? So we're going into court, losers, but by the time we get there, we now have gained control. We quickly put our names back in. We became the trustees of record. We reversed it back to religious society. And now we were in the driver's seat. You can't paint a better picture going into the court case that we went in as an underdog. But by the time we got there, we were in charge. So the stage was set. We came into court that day and Agnes and I had decided that we we're going to play a little mind game with the fellas. So what we did was we took all of the minute books that we had from going back to 1960 up to the current time. And I had them in my briefcase. I opened up my briefcase and I just started stacking the minute books along the wall and the looks that I got were priceless. They didn't know what we were up to. We weren't going to use them. They were just there. They didn't know what we were going to pull out of the books. Many minutes have been recorded. They had no idea what was in those minutes going back that far. It was just a head game. And so the judge came in. We all rose and 
And then the judge called according to order. And as we discussed at the JFK airport, as attorney small said that they were the plaintiff, they were suing us that they could put on their case first. And the general practice would be that they would put all their evidence on and then call apostle Rogers near the end of their presentation, which could have taken two or three days and then begin to grill him. But remember what I told you in the last recording, I told you that I asked attorney small, what would happen if they called him out of turn? And she said to me, that's not likely to happen, but if they do call him, we could put on our case through him. They would have called him out of turn. And I said to her, so let's prepare for that. And prepare we did. We had a transcript of the video of the 4th of July, which you'll see later on. And we had the VCR then, <laughs> VCR deck there. We had the monitor waiting to go. And so the plaintiff calls their first witness. The first witness was Mr. Gary, who was the man that was managing our two notch road property there in Columbia, South Carolina. And they asked him the basic questions about the property, about the value and about the tenants and the kind of stuff that they would have to ask him to substantiate that it existed and that it was an asset indeed. And he answered all the questions that lasted for about maybe 20 minutes. Then they called their next witness and they said, we call Huey L. Rogers. And when they said Huey L. Rogers, Attorney Smalls turned and looked at me and she mouthed the words, how did you know? And I just smiled. I couldn't tell her then. But of course we know because God informs us. And so as soon as they called him, they were in trouble. As a matter of fact, by the look on I.S. Levy Johnson's face, he knew he had been ambushed. He figured it out that we already knew he was going to try that he was going to try that little quick surprise call of Apostle Rogers. But we were ready. Our guns were loaded. And so we rolled out the video machine, popped in the tape. We gave the judge, Judge Joe Strickland, Judge Joseph Strickland, a copy of the transcript so he could follow along. And we hit play. There on that screen, the mother church, the audience, 1,500 plus people, the bishops sitting in the pulpit, and the assembly was in session. And we were watching the videotape to their surprise. I don't know if they didn't know, but they were seemingly surprised. As a matter of fact, the look on Apostle Showell's face was priceless. He looked quite disturbed and he mumbled, this don't make any sense. I don't know what he was talking about, but we had evidence. At some point, he got up and walked out. And as it got more and more into the video, Judge Joseph Strickland, who's probably about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, stands up from his chair, goes around to the back of his chair, leans on his rocker with transcript in hand, and peers into the video that's playing, and he says these words out loud. This is interesting and when he said that I.S. Levy Johnson Apostle Lawrence Campbell and all those that were on the side of the plaintiff knew that goose was cooked so immediately out of nowhere Apostle Campbell jumps up and says your honor we need to come to a settlement we need to talk about a settlement we stopped the tape and now they wanted to negotiate a settlement of the lawsuit that they, the plaintiff, was bringing against the defendant who was on the stand, Huey L. Rogers, that is our apostle. Interesting, but that was an admission that they knew they were going to lose. And so we broke the chambers. I was allowed to come into the chambers. It was myself, Apostle Rogers, Apostle Brown, Apostle Larley, and then they had on their side, Apostle Campbell, uh, Apostle Showell and I think Apostle Nelson might have been there as well but they were in the chambers with us we sat down in the chambers and the judge said to us he says this is a very interesting case but he wanted us to know that somebody was going to get nothing 
and somebody was going to get everything. Now, I don't know. We were the trustees of record. We now were the corporation coming into that meeting. They stopped the, the proceeding on our videotape that he thought to be very interesting. Our parliamentary procedure expert had submitted in writing the facts of the assembly and said they were in line with Robert's rules of order and our constitution. I'm kind of thinking we were going to get everything. We begin to negotiate back and forth. And let me tell you this. Many don't know this. We broke in caucus on our side. And Apostle Huey L. Rogers said this to us, us young guns. We were there. Uh, we 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 want to take no no prisoners. You know how we young men could be at the time. And Apostle Rogers said, "Listen, I know how you feel about this." He says, "But these are our brethren." He said, "I'm going to say that we'll just give them half of what we get, what we have. We'll give them half. We'll sell the property. We'll split the money. They get fifty percent. We get fifty percent, and we can go our way." Of course, our reaction was what? You know, because we knew we were the side that was going to get everything. We just knew that. But the Apostle Rogers, after what they had done to him, showed mercy. They need to know they wouldn't have gotten anything had it been left up to the young guns. But the man that they disrespected, the man who they ignored, the man who they gave a hard time, this gentleman said let's give them 50 percent we then started to write what is called the consent order within the consent order i have the signature of apostle lawrence g campbell acknowledging by extension of his signature that in the caption where it said that the bible way church of our lord jesus christ and its leader the apostle Huey L. rogers has saw fit to show benevolence to the executive committee, which included Lawrence Campbell. At that time, they knew they weren't by the way. But even leaving that courtroom, they still held themselves out to be by the way. They still had meetings using the name of by the way, using the logos of by the way, and telling the people in their organization that they are by the way. Knowing full well that they signed documents saying to the contrary it really is a shame but that's just the truth so people wonder why we were doing what we were doing and why we were acting the way we were acting because there were two sides to the story they were telling you that they were bible way but they had signed documents stating that they were not bible way so that was a problem for us it was a matter of honor and that honor was not being shown even though the apostle rogers had agreed to give them 50%. Not only did he agree, but he took that consent order to the General Assembly in Virginia and the General Assembly, after expelling these men, voted to give them 50% of our assets. And if they played the game the right way, they should have gone to their General Assembly and said to them, we want to give them 50%. But if I was a betting man, I will tell you that no such meeting took place. I will tell you that the assembly on that side did not get a chance to vote whether or not to give us 50% of what they perceived was theirs. It just happened. They probably don't even know the story or hear it for the first time. But the reality is, after we signed the consent order, it dragged on a little longer. There was property to sell. There were agreements to come to. And things were moving slow. And so what happened next was Apostle Rogers told me to call uh, Apostle Showell to arrange a conference of some kind. And so I remember I was sitting in the lobby at at the Temple Nation there in Hartford, Connecticut. And I said, "Okay, sir, I'll call him. And so I picked up the phone and I called Apostle Showell and I conveyed to him what the chief was asking me to do. And all of a sudden he just blew up. He said, it doesn't make any sense that that the, that the lieutenants are calling. The generals should be calling. And he, he went in on me, man. He laid me out and I respect him. So I didn't, you know, I tried to be nice. Well, sir, I'm just doing what I was told. And, you know, I, he just told me to call you. And then he, and he kept pushing in. And then he said these words. Well, maybe we ought to sue you. 
And maybe we ought to bring you into the lawsuit He said what's your address Maybe we ought to sue you And I, I ignored it because I thought he was just venting You know because he was mad that a lieutenant Was calling a general But would you not know That two weeks later I was included in the lawsuit So it, it now went To Huey L. Rogers and T. Allen Stringer Being sued Now all this time I'm just the go-between I'm just the person who's carrying the water. I'm the one who is communicating between Apostle Rogers and the lawyers in the organization. I'm 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 the one who's doing all the, you know, the pushing in to help keep things moving along as I was instructed to do. Here it is now I'm being sued. And you know what I said to myself when I found that I was being sued? I said thank you. Why did I say thank you? Because prior to that time I had to follow everything that the Apostle Rogers asked because his name was on the line. Even though I had a feeling about a certain thing and that I felt he shouldn't have accepted certain things, that was not my business. It was his life. It was his family. It was his future. So whatever he wanted, I did because that's what he wanted and it was his right to ask me to do that. But when they entered T. Allen Stringer in the mix, I want you to know it was the worst mistake in the world they could have made. I became a pro se litigant, i.e. I was a defendant and a lawyer at the same time. In my next video, I'm gonna tell you about what happened and I'm gonna close out this whole discussion about how we survived. But this was the turning point in which we would end the case once they brought me into the suit and made me a defendant, bad move, Thank God they did it. So here I am in Washington, D.C., facing a joint lawsuit. I've gone from being the water boy to the one who was assisting my presiding bishop to the one who now has been countersued by Showell, Showell, and Campbell. They were citing me for subverting the organization, acting unlawfully, and the such like in their complaint. How hypocritical. After our presiding bishop had exercised such mercy upon them, they would turn and do this. But nonetheless, I was rather excited about the idea that I get a chance to be my own lawyer. Well, so I approached Ken Slaughter and I said, Ken, I said, they're suing me now. I said, I'm thinking about becoming my own lawyer. What's your thought? Well, he gave me the old line, the adage that says a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. And I chuckled. I said, well, I guess I'll be that fool. I can't afford to hire a lawyer. And I believe I know enough about this case to defend myself. Besides, you be there to help me out. And he kind of chuckled. Well, here's the reality. The reality is that within the law firms, there is a relationship. And generally, it's a cordial relationship. He kind of told me that. They're not really in there to really fight each other. 
they're there oftentimes to try to bring compromise between the clients. And that can be good, except in the case where that compromise is costing you much money and is being stretched out by unreasonable men who frankly had lost in South Carolina, but still were trying to win. And in the public face, were trying to pass themselves off as something they were not, even according to what they had signed. So that was the case. So I became that fool. I began to figure out how to file my own brief. I began to look at the case from a different perspective. Not only was I defending myself, but I indeed was the defendant. But the only thing that Ken did not know, maybe he did know, but he didn't let on to know, is that by now, my guidance doesn't come from me. Literally throughout this entire case, those who had followed this case, including the lawyers, would admit to you that it was quite uncanny the way I would think of things and say things and find things. And I recognized it wasn't me. It was the God in me. It goes back to that dream that I had prior to all of this happening. You know that dream I told you about earlier in which Apostle Rogers and I were standing in the mother church in the room where the bishops usually get dressed for ceremony. And Apostle Williams was in a wheelchair and he was cold and he needed a jacket. And Chief asked me to find one. And when I turned to the open room to look for a jacket, I saw nothing but clouds and the feet of men. But that dream makes sense now. That dream literally meant that after Apostle Williams would die, that I would be a major player in the events that would follow. The number 18 and a half, 18 being life, and half meaning a split, and the legs of men in a clouded room, indicated that Bible way would be splitting. And the fact that I had a jacket in my hand and handed it to Apostle Rogers, that was the mantle that he would get concerning Bible way. I didn't know that then. I wasn't driven by that. I was driven by the pure ethic and the responsibility of right, as I thought we should all stand for. But these men failed to show me that. So here we are now in the home stretch, having won the case in South Carolina and having shown mercy where judgment should have been applied, at least according to what we thought, the Apostle Rogers, he applied mercy. Having said to these brethren, we will give you half of everything that you were not deserving of, they would sue me. Well, that's okay. So I proceeded forward. And it came time to go down to Washington, D.C. to negotiate a settlement. I was not going to play the Washington legal game. You know, where they fight in the court at day and celebrate at night in the bar and drink and have dinner together, even though they have clients that are opposing each other. That was not going to be my game. When I looked into the case, I began to pull it apart as one who was going to scorch the earth. And I began to notice some things. I noticed that for at least 11 years, one party was not by the way and the other party was. Both of us could not be the Bible Way Church. In as much as the tax identification number, which is held by the legally registered organization, is non-transferable, both of us could not use that number. And I began to dig and follow that line of thinking, and I realized that there was a gross violation of the IRS code. Simply put, for that period of time, whichever group was not Bible Way, but holding themselves out to be by the way and collecting offerings and monies across state line without a proper tax identification number. They were committing fraud against the Internal Revenue Service. So I began to look up the statutes regarding that. And I began to realize that as a pro se litigant, my leverage of strength was to bring the threat that the judge would have to rule on the fact that one of these groups is not a tax exempt organization and that for the past 10 years or so they have been carrying on collecting monies without paying taxes and boy they were in trouble especially as the money crossed state lines and i knew that to be the case so i put it in my complaint among other things and i spelled out the case to the judge and so as we were moving in that vein uh, we got calls from the lawyers that represented uh, Apostle Showell and Camel and the group that now calls himself IBW. 
And they wanted to compromise again. They wanted to meet and to discuss. So now I'm going to go to their law offices as a defendant and a pro se litigant. I was going as a lawyer and one who was being defended by me, the lawyer. And so the Apostle Rogers wasn't able to make it to that meeting, but he was determined to bring this to resolve. So I also had to go down there and represent his side. That is the organization side. So I'm wearing like three big hats here. And then I also wrote the terms of which we were going to accept a surrender in this case that sprung from the PTO, the infringement of our trademark. And so as we were driving down, my wife and I, I was contemplating what would be the end, what would be the finality of this case. And I was comfortable in my spirit to know that God was going to give us victory. So we met up at the office and Bishop Brian Collins accompanied us. It was just myself, Lady Stringer and Bishop Brian Collins because the apostle couldn't make it, but wanted this case to end. So he sent me. We come into this plush law office. I mean, they had it going on wood and brass everywhere. As a matter of fact, it was so going on that while Lady and I were sitting in the waiting room to go into the conference area to meet with their lawyers, Across the hall, we saw the gentleman that plays on Law and Order. You know, the one with the white hair? I don't know his name right now. The old gentleman with the all white hair. This guy walks by. It's like, man, they got it going on. And rumor has it that their lawyers cost them $1,100 an hour. That's a lot of money. Ours was above $700, so they're about $700 an hour. Venable costs us about $700 an hour. I'm to understand that their lawyers cost them $1,100 an hour. So they, they had it going on. And so finally they called us into the room to meet with them. It was attorney Ken Slaughter, attorney Roger Kalazi from Venable, uh, myself, Lady Stringer, and Bishop Brian Collins. It was five of us. And we go into this huge conference room with a mahogany table that had to be at least 15 to 20 feet long and about six feet wide. And on the other side, a few female lawyers and a few male lawyers. And then also uh, we had uh, Apostle Showell and we had Apostle Floyd Nelson and Bishop Marcel Showell. And so we sat down. And the first thing that happened when we sat down uh, before we got to business, they began to whisper and begin to inquire, why was my wife there? And, you know, and then they asked me the question, well, you know, they want to know uh, why your wife is there and should she be excused? I said, no, she should not be excused. I said, she is my secretary. And she was. I said, so she could stay. So Renee stayed. So it was just us three sitting there. And on the table, there was a conference phone. And on that conference line was Apostle Lawrence Campbell. So the stage was set. And we handed the documents over to them, the one that I had constructed regarding the things that we wanted from them in order for this case to finally end. And I'll name some of those things. Uh, one of the things that we wanted in particular was that they would cease and desist with using our logo and trademark, that they would quit calling themselves as Bible Way. They would not use it to license anymore. They would not print it uh, as a cover for their programs or for their banners. And there were several other things in there that I thought was very strenuous to include my docket that I filed. They read over it and then they looked up at our attorneys and said, OK, we accept it all. And attorney Roger Kalazi, who is a serious litigator, looked at Ken with a puzzled look on his face. And he said, can we be excused for a minute? And they said, sure. And so we all hurried on out of the room to another area where we were held up. And when we entered into that room, Attorney Kalazi looked at Ken and said, do you believe that? He said, no, I've never seen that before. He said, they actually gave us everything we want without a counter. So, of course, we being the novices, even though I was a pro se litigant, I'm still a novice even to this day. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, they don't do that. Usually we go back and forth for a while and we decide what the terms are going to be. But seldom do they just agree at the first salvo of what you give them. And I said, well, what do you think made them do that? And Roger looked at me. He said, it's because of what you wrote. That's why they capitulated. So what I wrote 
was a threat to them. It was going to cause them to be in violation of the IRS code. It was going to cause them to be fined up to a thousand dollars and possibly one year in jail. Not to mention all of the taxes that will be due based on the delinquency of not paying taxes on the monies you gathered at your conference while calling yourself something you were not and using a TIN number that belonged potentially to someone else. That was the problem. And then my mind rolled back to the dream that Agnes Edwards had. And Agnes said, string, it was a bloodless coup. Simply meaning there was no shedding of blood, no personal aggression. They succumbed to our desires. And that's what happened in Washington, D.C. From that day forward, we had to deal with the reality of now there being a Bible way church and what would they call themselves? The Apostle Rogers, and this is true, gave them permission to use the name, the International Bible Way Church of Jesus Christ. Trust me when I tell you that. That was something we signed off on and agreed they could use. They had already gone to Baltimore and registered as an organization, but they were not really calling themselves that at the time. Do the research. Those of you who know how to get around at the Secretary of State's office in Baltimore, just go to your own research online. You can find it online and you will find it. I do have a copy of the documents, but you can see the dates. And the dates don't match up with the 1997 uh, so-called schism. And if they were IBW, it would have been registered, I should say, in 1997. But it wasn't registered until the year 2000 in the next century, in and around, I think, 2008 or 11. In April of that year. So all those years they weren't Bible way. They weren't registered in D.C. Because we were on record from that time forward. Once we settled with the DCRA. The name Huey Rogers. Terry Stringer. And all the others. Were registered as the trustees. Of the Bible way church. Registered by. The Apostle Smallwood Williams. However we did agree. In that settlement. To allow IBW to make historical reference to our common heritage. And I want to underscore that common heritage does not indicate years in existence. It means we come from the same stock, but as far as an organization is concerned, they are not 62 years old. I don't know why they keep saying that, but that's how they operate. Technically they are as old as their registration in Maryland, which is around 2008, 2011, but they have not been registered as an organization since 1957. And they are not a continuation of the works of Apostle Williams because they were expelled in 1997. But they are a new group that Apostle Showell established that has a common heritage. Please understand that. So here's the summary of it. We have always been the Bible way church of our Lord Jesus Christ worldwide. The apostle Williams said that there will always be a Bible way church. We had not stopped being that church from the 4th of July assembly. Once the interim ship was over and apostle Campbell had forfeited his right to be voted on first by not serving as a VP as promised in the ratification of the assembly and the bishops under apostle Huey L. Rogers. Secondly, by trying to change the corporation to become a nonprofit organization versus what apostle Williams made it a religious society. And then being expelled from Bible way, he and the other 27 bishops, apostle Campbell, For that period of time, once we settled those documents in D.C. at the D.C.R.A., until they registered the IBW and we gave them the right to use it without dissent, did not have an organization. It was smoke and mirrors. Bible way always existed. And in point of fact, the successor from Apostle Williams was the Honorable Apostle Huey L. Rogers. For the order of succession held that once the assembly decided, then that person would be the presider for life. And that's what Apostle Campbell was going for. 
Had he just cooled his jets and not gone out and changed the organization's designation and did the nefarious things that he did and come back in 1998, he was running unopposed. I don't know why he didn't get that. He would have walked right into the office. He was a made man. But you know what they say about pride? It goes before a fall. This is Apostle T. Allen Stringer. And I'm glad that I was able to inform you regarding the year of impasse. Now, listen, here's what we're going to do from here. I'm going to release the entire series re-edited again with the 4th of July total video. So you can watch it from start to finish that assembly we had with all the accompanying documents, the PDFs and the file and case numbers. You can look this up for yourself. This is for the record. I just want to leave the proper legacy going forward so all will know the truth. For you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Until then, God bless you.